now she's back. and she's back as a faculty member at the Weizmann Institute. Um, she's done amazing work, very creative work in a large number of areas within distributed computation, all the way from constructing spanners to spiking neural networks. And today she's going to talk about massively parallel derandomization topics. And um, uh, we're excited to hear what she has to say. Go Thank ahead. you, Ernie. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Do you owe me well? Good. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah. so this work is based on uh, lots of joint work and many discussions with my great uh, colleagues, uh, Karen, Arthur, Peter, Michal, Moussen, Mooney, uh, Gregory, and uh, Elon. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so randomization is an important resource in a uh, computation and as such the question whether randomization is actually necessary in computation is a question that we ask a lot in many computational settings. In the centralized setting, there is this famous BPP equals a P conjecture, where PP, BPP is the class of all decision problems that can be solved polynomially with good probability using randomization, and P is the class of all decision problems that can be solved without randomization. So this is still a conjecture, but in the area of uh, distributed local algorithms, we also had this analog uh, complexity classes, P local and PR local, where here P, the polynomial equivalent in distributed. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Can you make your slides full screen? There was a... I think there are full screen. Um, I think there's a... We're seeing power. Oh, let me let me let me check again. Uh, now it's good. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. So in the distributed local algorithm setting, we have these analog classes of P-local and P-R-local. The polynomial time analog of in distributed algorithms is polylog. And recently in a very exciting breakthrough result, uh, Rosen and Gavari show that indeed these two classes are equivalent. That means that at least for the purpose of polylog computation, randomness is not necessary. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, another exciting model, which is that of massively parallel uh, computation. And we'll try to address this gap between randomized and distributed algorithms that we have in this setting. So let me start by introducing, uh, so this would be our outline. We'll start by short introduction into the model. We'll see a very uh, general recipe for the randomization, and then we'll see a more concrete recipe uh, developed with uh, Arthur and, uh, and Peter uh, that works, that give us some good uh, deterministic algorithm for MIS and maximal matching. We'll see some alternative approaches for the randomization, and at the end, I'll mention some key barriers and open problems in this area. Okay. Uh, so the MPC model, I'm going to explain it very much from the perspective of a distributed person and from someone that would like to solve graph problems with this model. Uh, so we are given, this model was introduced by uh, Karlov Suri and Vasilaski in 2010. And in this setting, we are given some N vertex graph uh, G. It's very large. We cannot store it at a single machine. And we are lucky because we have M machines. So every machine, as some parameter, the parameter S specify the local memory of the machine. And the communication works in synchronous rounds in an all-to-all -all communication manner. At every round, every machine can either send or receive roughly order of S bits from each of the other uh, machines. So in this model, we distinguish between two types of, uh, of uh, settings. The first is the linear MPC, where the local memory S is linear, linear in the number of nodes of the graph. In the sublinear MPC, the, linear, the local memory is sublinear, is n to the delta for any specific, for any given parameter delta. And usually when we do algorithms in the sublinear MPC, we would like our algorithm to be fully scalable. We would like them to work for any given input uh, uh, delta. The global memory is then simply the number of machines times the local memory. Usually we would like the global memory to be as tight as possible, that is roughly as the number of edges in the graph, 
In this talk, I'll be slightly less orthodox, and I also allow the global memory to have this additional of n to the one of plus delta. We can discuss this uh, aspect towards the end of the talk, if that's really necessary. Okay, so this is the MPC uh, model. And at least from the perspective of distributed graph algorithms, this model can be connected to two well-known uh, models in distributed uh, graph algorithms. The first model is the congested clique model. This model was introduced by Lotker et al. in 2005. And the way that we traditionally think about this model is as follows, we are given the graph G. And this graph G is the graph on which we would like to solve the problem, but the communication graph is actually the complete graph, where in every round, every two nodes in this graph, even though if they are not neighbors in the input graph, they can still exchange log and bits of information. If I want to describe this model in the language of MPC, I will just say that I have N machine, one per node, and in every round, every machine can exchange order of N bits of information with each of the other nodes. Here, the global memory is, is N square, and as you can see, this model is very much related to the linear MPC, at least with respect to the size of the uh, local memory. Another model that is related to the MPC, even at first glance, it might seem not that uh, directed, but now we have evidence that it is very direct, very connected. This is the local model. The local model is actually the most classic model that we have in distributed graph algorithms attributed to lineal. And in this model, the input graph for which we want to solve the problem, this is the standard view in distributed, is in fact the communication graph. That means that in every round, only two nodes that are neighbors in this input graph can exchange information. Here, we don't have any bandwidth limitations. So in this sense, the local model is kind of easier than the congested click. We have no bandwidth limitation, but we are restricted by the locality. In our rounds, the best that we can do is just to collect the topology of our hardball. Um, so recently, Gavari Kohn and you to show that actually this model captures so very much related, I'll say more about it, to the sublinear uh, uh, MPC model. Okay, so these are the, the connection to, to what we know. And within this setting, we are going to zoom into the class in this talk of local graph algorithms. What is this class? These are the set of all problems, graph problems, that if you give me the solution to the problem to verify that the solution is correct, it is sufficient for each node to inspect just a constant ball around it. For example, coloring. If you give me the right vertex coloring to see that it's correct, it's sufficient to look at the color of my neighbors. In the literature of uh, local graph algorithms, usually and traditionally, we, we just focus on four main problems. It's kind of changing over the last years, but the most traditional problems to study are the maximal independent set problem, where we wish to find a set of nodes that are not neighbors, and they are maximal, not maximum. We have the uh, delta plus one vertex coloring problem and the analog problem for the edge case, which is maximal matching, which is like MIS on the line graph and edge coloring. Okay, so these are the set of problems that we usually look at um, in a distributed setting. And here is our objective. The whole setting of studying local problems in the MPC model received a lot of attention recently. We have amazing, good algorithms but they are randomized. For this randomized setting, we have very good algorithms, even sublogarithmic for most of the problems that we know. The problem is that we still have a gap between the randomized setting and the distributed uh, and the deterministic setting. And our goal is to somehow narrow this gap. To do that, we can think about two steps of approach. First, let's be less ambitious and at least let's try to have deterministic MPC algorithms that at least match the randomized complexity in the local model, okay? The second step, if we start understanding that, we can be even more ambitious where we try to actually match or get closer to the randomized complexity in the MPC model itself, okay? So, so that will be uh, our goal. Uh, and I'll start by giving a recipe, a very classic recipe that is known already from the early uh, 90s. And this recipe will give us first order solution with polylog rounds for many of the problems that we know. So let me start with explaining this high level uh, idea of the recipe. And this recipe works 
in particular for the parallel setting, but also for classic distributed setting, and it is based on two main ingredients. The first ingredient is based on low independence. That is, if we look at many of the randomized, classic randomized algorithms, many times we don't really, we notice, one can notice that you don't really need full independence. Bounded independence should be sufficient, and that means that our probability space can actually be much smaller. Okay, so this is the first step. And the second step is to say, okay, I don't really need a large probability space. I can narrow down to a small one, but then I still need efficient algorithm to find this good seed, to find this uh, 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 good deterministic algorithm, even within this small seed, this small uh, search space. So these are the two ingredients and I'll uh, elaborate a bit more about them. So I think this is the most technical uh, slide uh, in, this, in this presentation and we really don't need all the details. I'll just say that when we say bounded independence, we say that a given family of functions is k-wise independent if the, uh, value, the random variables h of x1 to h of xk are fully independent for whenever h is uniformly uh, sampled from the family uh, of uh, h. And luckily we have very efficient constructions of k-wise independent ash functions and to specify a function in this family, it's sufficient to have a small seed roughly of, uh, of k log n bits. We also have good concentration bounds. In particular, in this talk, we are going to focus on constant-wise independent ash functions. And for that, we have also the Chernoff analog or things that are sufficiently good for our purposes. I will not go into the detail, just that you know that all these uh, uh, ash functions, we al always need some analog of uh, to obtain concentration bounds. Okay. So now let me explain the second ingredient, which is that of the conditional expectation. And this is actually the algorithm that allows us to find this good ash function in this small family of ash functions. How can we do that? So we are going to view this process as maximizing some objective function. So think of a single randomized phase of a coloring algorithm. Our goal at every point, say, is to maximize the number of nodes that gets colored. The first step tells us that if we use a family of bounded independence, the expected number of colored nodes is going to be good, okay? So we have some uh, uh, objective function and we know that an expectation using this bounded independent ash function, the value is good. So now our goal is actually to find this function h in the family that provides us value as least as the one provided by the expected value. So the way that we are going to do that is that every machine is going to compute its own value of f restricted to the set of edges that it sees, restricted to the set, to the part of the input that it gets. And by linearity of expectation, the summation of all these values is just the expected value of the entire system, okay? And now the most traditional way to find this good seed is to do it in a bit by bit manner. At every point of time, we are going to have some fixed partial seed S prime, and then every machine should compute the conditional expectation of this function in a local way restricted to the given seed, and it's going to make a vote, either zero or one, what should be the next bit in the seed B. So this way, the machines gradually are going to agree on the shared seed is going to dictate the good hash function. So let me give, give some example how we actually find the good seed to simulate some random round t, okay? So suppose we have some randomized algorithm, we have round t in this randomized algorithm, the nodes flip, flip coins, but now I want to simulate this round in a deterministic manner, okay? So I want to find this good hash function so that once node have this hash function, they can simulate the random decision using this seed, okay? So suppose that the seed length is just four. That means that the number of deterministic algorithms in my search space is 16, because once I give you the seed, I specify the seed, the algorithm is just deterministic. So now we can think about that as a voting process. All the nodes think in their head, what would be my fate if the first bit in the seed is zero? Half of the deterministic algorithm are going to behave like that. And they are going to compare 
their fate in this class of algorithm compared to the setting where the first bit is one and they are going to make their vote to their preferable uh, bit. So for example, they can choose zero. Once the first bit is fixed, then we move on, we cut the search space by half and we move on to deciding the next bit in the seed. Uh, again, all the machines can think about all the scenarios where the second bit is either zero and one and pick the right one. At every step, the search space is cut by uh, two until all the machines, all or, or the nodes in this case, agree on the one seed that specified the good ash function. Okay. So this is just the general recipe that, that we have. And as we said, if we look at at least the classical randomized local algorithms, those that have polylog round complexity, at least for them, usually bounded independence is sufficient. And that means that if we combine it with this bit by bit exploration, we can get polylog deterministic algorithms for many classical problems. So really the fight here is over this polylog. We really want to find the right answer, maybe even go below log to find sublogarithmic bounds as we have for the randomized case, but this, these are just the, the, the range of what we are going to fight for. Okay, um, so perhaps the, one of the first works that did this de-randomization of Luby in MPC-like models, it was in the congested click, but it can also be casted as a linear MPC model, uh, is our work uh, with Karen and, uh, and Gregory. And there our goal is, was to find the best MIS algorithm, the deterministic MIS algorithm in the congested click or linear MPC model. And I won't get too much into the details of that work, but I'll just say that it has this two phase of solution. We looked at Gavari's MIS algorithm and that algorithm has two phases, a randomized phase of log delta rounds and the post chattering phase, which was deterministic. So our algorithm was to notice that first, the, every phase, every each of the rounds in the randomized phase of Gavari's algorithm can be implemented with pairwise independence. And that means that overall the nodes should decide on log delta times log n random coins, and they do just do it in a bit by bit manner. In the second phase, we had to work a bit harder in order to be in a situation that the number of undecided nodes, nodes that are still not, didn't decide if they are in the MAS or not, the total subgraph induced on this graph has linear size. At that point, we just collected everything to a single machine and we completed the work, the computation locally, okay? So with this approach, we obtained a log delta log n randomized a deterministic algorithm for MIS. And if delta was at most square root n, it could be optimized to get log delta round algorithm, okay? In this talk, I would actually like to discuss the randomization in the sublinear MPC uh, regime. And this, is, this concerns a work with, uh, with uh, Arthur uh, and Peter. And we already can notice that if we think about this sublinear MPC regime, the local memory is too small. It's roughly n, let's think about it as n to the delta. I'll need some constant later on, so let it be n to the height delta. And this local memory is too small in the sense that I cannot even guarantee that all the edges of a given node will be stored at the same machine. Okay, specifically, I cannot just implement the algorithm, the MAS algorithm that I just described here, because the last step of that algorithm was to collect a linear size subgraph and solve it locally. This is something that we cannot do in sublinear space. Okay, so we kind of need of a totally different approach when we discuss a sublinear MPC models. Okay. So before delving into, into the derandomization approach, I will just say that there are some useful tools that we usually apply in this sublinear MPC setting, and the most basic one concerns with sorting. So suppose every machine stores some values x1 to overall in the system, we have values x1 to xn, and we wish to sort them. This can be done in constant uh, uh, many rounds. And we can do other sort of aggregate functions 
in a very efficient manner, even deterministically in this sublinear MPC regime. And that in particular implies that throughout the talk, even though we are living in this sublinear MPC regime and we cannot store the entire neighborhood of a node on a machine, we can at least be in a more convenient setting where the neighborhood of, a, of every node is stored as continuous blocks. So I can assume that machine M1 have a continuous set of neighbors incident to V, and then the rest of the neighbors are going to be continuous allocated at M2, et cetera, okay? We can also compute aggregate functions first, et cetera. So, so this is some tools uh, to keep in mind. And then our all goal, in order to compute deterministically, say, MIS, maximal matching, coloring, and et cetera, is to do some sort of graph specification. This is the most natural thing to do. The graph is too dense in order, the graph is too dense in order to just allocate the, all the edges of a given node on a machine. So let's try to sparsify it into a low degree subgraph so that at least we can see the two op neighborhood of a given machine, of a given node on a single machine. So, so this is what we would like to do. But we would like to sparsify the graph in a smart manner. We would like that once we sparsify the graph and I solve the problem on the sparsified graph, the progress that I get with respect to the number of colored nodes or with respect to the number of nodes removed or added to the MIS would be sufficiently large as if I work on the original graph. So this approach of graph sparsification occurred a lot before, especially in the randomized uh, setting. So there is a whole bunch of uh, list of uh, works and I I'm sorry if I missed uh, some of the works, I'm, I'm sure I did, okay. Uh, but all these work were randomized and I'll touch upon this point later on also in, in the talk. And our goal here is to do a deterministic specification, okay? So it's very much different than, than what we had uh, before, okay? So we are going to see now a deterministic graph specification that would lead to the following for sublinear MPC setting, it will give us deterministic MIS and maximal matching in time which essentially match the randomized local complexity of the problem, which is log delta plus some log log n term, okay? And we'll also have delta plus one coloring in time that we are still unhappy about it, but it's log delta plus log log n. It will also give us a, a, a quite surprisingly a simple algorithm to solve delta plus one coloring in constant rounds in the linear MPC setting, okay? So this will be the highlight of what I'll try to, to convey from that point on, okay? So in order to, to illustrate the algorithm, we actually go back and de-randomize and compute deterministically MIS. That would be our goal, to compute deterministically MIS via deterministic graph specification. We actually go back to the well-known Luby's algorithm, okay? So, so let's recall this uh, Luby's algorithm. It's uh, this algorithm as log n steps or phases, where in every phase, so long that we are still not done, every node V just picks a random number uniformly at random in the range zero, one. And it's going to join the MIS only if its values, sorry, it should be strictly smaller than all the values suggested by its neighbors. Once we pick this MIS, we edit this IS, we add it to the set and we remove its neighbors from a G. Now this all analysis of Luby is based on a very simple definition of good nodes, okay? So what is a good node? I said that a god is, is good if many of its neighbors have degree which is small, that is smaller than its own degree, okay? Why do I want to say that this node is good? Because a good node has two properties, okay? The first one, we can show that if a node is good, then with good probability, at least one of its neighbors is going to join the independent set and therefore is going to be removed. And the second property is that these good nodes, they are incident to at least a constant fraction of the edges in the graph. So at every phase of Luby, I'm going to be in a situation where at least half of the, or some constant fraction of the good nodes are going to be removed, and therefore a constant fraction of the edges are going to be removed, and therefore after log n number of phases, I'm going to be done, okay? So, so this is the entire analysis of Luby's algorithm, which we'll try to imitate with our deterministic algorithm, okay? So here's our goal. Our goal is to actually implement 
every phase of Luby's algorithm using constant MPC rounds, okay? So we already know from Luby that even pairwise independent ASH function is, is sufficient to simulate this phase. And that means that the seed length is just logarithmic. In order to compute the seed length in constant number of rounds, I want to do it very fast. I want the machines to be able to agree on a chunk of log n bits in the random seed at a time in constant number of rounds, okay? So this is what we would like to do. We have this node V and this node V is good. I'm going to assign for every possible assignment to, let's just imagine that the seed is of size log n, exactly log n, and let's imagine that I have n machines. So for each assignment, I have n possible assignment to the log n bits, I'm going to assign a machine. And my good node is going to send some message, some feedback to each of the other machines concerning how good my situation is going to be if this is going to be the seed, okay? If I have this machinery, I will be able to decide on a chunk of log n bits in the random seed at a time. I'm going to really exhaust the entire all-to-all -all communication setting here. The problem is that in order for a node, a good node V, to decide if a given seed is good for it or not, it needs to see whether it's going to be removed when making decisions where its neighbors are making decisions using this seed. And that depends on the two up ball because the neighbors depends on their own neighbors and they need to see that their number is indeed a maximum in their in neighborhood. So every node V, provided that the machine could store the two op neighborhood of a given node, we could be in a situation that we can find log n bits at a time. But the problem is that not only that we cannot store the two op ball in a single machine, we, can, we cannot even store a single a one op neighborhood on a given machine. And here comes our idea to do this graph specification. I would just say that Luby handled this problem using another approach of what we call pessimistic estimator, but that was limited because then it could only detect one bit at a time. And we want to detect log, log n bits at a time. And for that, we need this graph specification. Okay, so what we want to do is to do this form of specification. We would like to find a subset of nodes that we call Q, such that the subgraph induced on this set of nodes, the maximum degree of this subgraph is going to be small, small enough so that the two op ball in this subgraph is going to be, is going to fit a single machine. Then I would like to compute to simulate the single face of Luby only in this subgraph GQ, okay? And I would like to claim that the progress that I get when working on GQ is almost the same as working on the original graph G, okay? So, so that would be my goal. So here in the figure, you can see the red nodes are those that belong to Q and V is a good node. So it might be the case that during this specification, the final step, the final subset Q does not contain our good notes. But this is not important. The important thing is that these good notes are still going to have a large chance of being removed due to their neighbors that survive in this, uh, in, in this subset, okay? So in order to illustrate this graph specification, Let's assume, and we actually can assume that almost without loss of generality, that all the nodes in the graph have degrees roughly concentrated, something between n to the i delta to n to the i plus one delta. I can assume that without loss of generality up to losing one over delta fraction, delta fraction of the edges, right? Because there are only one over delta classes of, deg of, a, a, of degree classes, okay? With this in mind, our graph specification is going to sparsify the graph. Our goal is to get to a point where all the degrees in the graph are roughly n to the delta. For that, we are going to have i steps, where i is this constant next to the degree, i steps of graph specification. Every step in this graph specification is going to kill roughly one over n to the delta fraction of the nodes, okay? At any given point, when we have Vj minus one, we would like to compute Vj, okay, 
And we are going to do that by picking a good hash function. This hash function, once we find this good hash function, we can simulate this random decision of joining with probability of one over n to the delta in the following manner. Sampling with probability one over n to the delta is the same as saying V is going to join the new set Vj only if the hash function, the hash value on V is at most n to the three minus delta where n, to, where n cube is the, is the uh, size of the domain. Okay, so we are going to have these steps of graph specification every time we cut the number of nodes and their degrees by roughly uh, n to the minus delta, okay? And there are some properties that we are going to maintain throughout this specification. The first property is that we are going to make sure that the degrees of the nodes are not that large. And we're also going to make sure that every node B, every good node, is going to have sufficiently many neighbors in this set that are light, that have low degree, okay? These properties can be shown to hold with constant wise independence, and we will use this method of conditional expectation to make sure that we indeed find such a hash function, okay? The only thing that I want to stress is why we need to do this I steps of graph sparsification, okay? Why cannot we just cut the degrees at once from n to the i delta to n to the delta? And the reason why the speed of sparsification is n to, the min n to the minus delta is due to the space of every machine. Every machine is going to see roughly n to the four delta edges, okay? And it's going to decide locally whether a given hash function is good or not. And for that, we would like you to see sufficiently many edges so that we would have some concentration at each machine, okay? So this is why it's important so that if every machine is going to vote for the seed, for the seed that looks like random, for the seed that really kills roughly n to the minus delta fraction of the nodes or of the edges that it, uh, it sees, okay? Okay, so once we do these steps of a, a graph specification, at the end we get to this graph GVI, is maximum degree is n to the four delta. This is small enough so that we can just collect the two op ball of every good node into a single machine. And then we can just simulate a single phase of Luby in this graph GVI. But because of these all properties that we kept on maintaining, we are going to be in a situation that every good node still has many light nodes that survive this graph specification, okay? And therefore is going to have good probability of being removed, okay? So, so this is really what highlights this, um, what summarizes this idea of, a, of graph specification. We are computing deterministically a sparse graph such that running the deterministic version of Fluby is going to have the same effect as if we run on the original uh, graph, okay. So already that, I'll just wrap up what we can get from this approach, at least for the MAS problem. We get to a point that every phase of Fluby we can simulate using constant number of MPC rounds, but Luby has log n phases, so that means log n rounds. If we want to get to the final bound of log delta plus log log n rounds, we need to implement more ideas. Specifically, once the degree are smaller, we can employ some more uh, techniques of round compression via graph exponentiation. That is, we can just collect very fast a ball of radius roughly log n over log delta into a single machine, we can do it once. And once we do that, we can just simulate a chunk of log n over log delta phases of Luby in constant rounds. So this is just improvement that one can have for delta that is much smaller than n. But the high level idea is really this log n round uh, uh, algorithm based on uh, graph specification. Okay. So the second algorithm that I would like to discuss is actually concerning delta plus one coloring. And here the, yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, this is the 10 minute warning. It's, okay. it's actually 11 minutes, but I thought it would be a better time to break. Okay, okay. <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, 
So the second problem that I would like to present some thought of deterministic graph specification for is the delta plus one coloring. And actually here we see the more dramatic effect when we consider the linear MPC uh, setting. So let me actually start by reviewing what we know about this delta plus one uh, uh, coloring problem. There has been a lot of work going on, especially in the, in the randomized uh, setting. Uh, and up to the point that we got to this uh, breakthrough result of uh, Chang et al from last year that can provide us constant round algorithm for computing delta plus one coloring in the linear MPC uh, setting. There is also another type of randomized solutions that are based on palette sparsification due to a, a Asadi et al, alone in Asadi, et cetera. Uh, so also these algorithms are randomized. And let me just say that these algorithms are randomized in the strong sense. I mean, we cannot really simulate them with bounded independence. They have this shattering effect that I'm going to maybe mention later on. So it's really going to be hard to de-randomize them just by using a small number of a, a small seed. Okay. Uh, we also had some previous deterministic solution in this log delta uh, uh, regime to the problem. And what I would like to discuss now is a recently new algorithm that provides deterministic delta plus one list coloring algorithm in constant rounds. And what I like about this algorithm is just that it's super simple, maybe even simpler than the randomized algorithms. We, we don't need any heavy machinery. Um, and to explain this algorithm, we can just think about a very simple randomized procedure. For this randomized procedure, constant wise independence will be sufficient. So once I, we explain the randomized procedure, we can just apply the, the black box derandomization toolbox. So let's just think about this randomized procedure. And this randomized procedure is recursive and it's going to partition both the nodes and the colors into separate and almost independent beans, okay? So suppose the maximum degree, okay, it's delta, it's given by the, the problem, delta plus one coloring. So we are just going to take our nodes and roughly throw them uniformly at random into delta to the O of one beans, okay? Now we are going to have one bean that I call pending bean, and that bean is special, okay? Why? because for all these green beans, I'm going to throw not only nodes uniformly at random, but I'm going also to throw the colors into these beans uniformly at random. So if the problem is delta plus one coloring, I can just take the one to the one delta plus one colors and just to throw them into these beans. And that means that now every bean is required to solve a problem with only the set of colors assigned to it, okay? but I'm going to have a special bin that assigned only nodes, but not colors, okay? So this is a, a partitioning of both nodes and colors. We saw a same idea happening in, the, in this Chang et al randomized uh, algorithm, okay? So this partitioning is just randomized. It's very balanced. But then we look at what we got from this randomized procedure. And if we got things that are not concentrate well, Okay, soon I'll say what I mean by that. I just throw it into the bad guy's bin. Okay, so overall, I'm going to have two special bins, the pending bin, this is a legal bin that assigned only notes but not colors, and a bad guy's bins that accumulate all the bad bins that did not concentrate well uh, according to, to what I want. And then the approach is as follows. I'm going to look at all most of all these beans that assign both nodes and colors, and I'm going to solve them recursively in parallel. Those instances of coloring are independent. They touch upon different nodes and they're going to assign different colors. So I can just elden them recursively, simultaneously in parallel, okay? Once I'm done with this bulk of beans, I'm going to be back to the pending bin Okay, I'm going to update this bin doesn't have any, we didn't allocate any special colors for this bin. So I'm just going to let every node update its palette based on the colors already taken by its neighbors in the other bins, okay? 
And then I'm just recursively going to apply the algorithm on the pending bin, okay? Once I'm done, I'm going to be back to the bad guys bin. I'm going to look at all the colors that are left, and we are going to guarantee that this subgraph on bad guys is super sparse. It just has linear number of edges, so I can just locally collect it and solve everything, okay? So overall, we are going to have this partitioning of both nodes and colors using constant wise independence. I'm going to de-randomize it using the, the known recipe, but then I'm going to look at the main good beans. From these beans, I would like them to be small, as small as I would expect by a randomized partitioning. I would like the beans to have sufficiently small degree because I want this reduction in the degrees. And I would like that in every bean that assigned colors, the size of the palette of every node is at least as large as its degree. So I can solve a delta plus one coloring problem, okay? If I have a misbehaved nodes or beans, I just throw them to the bad guys beans, but this is going to be sparse, okay? And because the recursive, the, the, the sparsification rate, the partitioning rate is roughly delta to the O of one, after nine steps, I'm going to be left with roughly n over delta nodes, the induced graphons that is going to be linear. So all the leaves of this recursion are going just to be sparse and are going to be solved locally by collecting them, okay? So, so this is kind of a, a very simple algorithm to be implemented with just constant wise independence. And, and note that it still falls within this graph sparsification setting because we do sparsify the graph by partitioning the nodes into separate bins, we forget about all edges between nodes in different bins. We only look at edges of between nodes uh, of nodes in the same bin, and this is the specification effect. So all the edges of nodes that fall in separate bins are kind of eliminated, and this is the specification that we get. Okay, so now it's say uh, three minutes left. <laughs> okay, <laughs> wow. Okay, so I'll just briefly mention that beyond, um, beyond bounded independence, there are also other approaches. Uh, I'll say just a sentence about it. Uh, one useful tool is that of PRG. So a PRG is a kind of polynomial time algorithm that if you give it a small random seed, it can expand it to a long one in a way that fools particular programs, okay? So in many cases, the random event that I wish to occur can be formalized as a simple program. And in this case, instead of using bounded independence, it might be worthwhile just to think about a, a PRG. I, I will not go into the example I had in mind. Let me just jump here. Where we stand and how to move forward. Okay. So this is the, the state of the art picture that we currently have, at least for the linear MPC setting or congested clip. We have these traditional problems of uh, maximum matching and maximal independence set. In the randomized setting, we can solve these problems very fast in log log delta rounds. Currently, the best deterministic algorithm that we have runs in log delta rounds plus some sub log uh, log, log and uh, term. So clearly, there is a large gap here. We have no sub logarithmic time algorithm, deterministic algorithms for MIS or matching. Moving to vertex coloring, here we are happy. The, the problem is kind of resolved. We have constant around deterministic algorithm in the, in the setting. There is also some uh, randomized result for uh, uh, edge coloring, but let me not delve into that because of lack of time and move on to what we know on the sublinear MPC regime. Okay, so here we still have some sublogarithmic bounds that are randomized by Gavari and Yuto. And still the deterministic, best deterministic bound that we have, as, as we say, just logarithmic, okay? If we look at delta plus one vertex coloring, here is another interesting gap. In the randomized setting, we have this triple log algorithm, whereas in the deterministic setting, we still have nothing uh, uh, sub-logarithmic. And I want to mention like few of the challenges that we are going to run into. If we look at this gap for delta plus one coloring, we said that we have this triple log and round algorithm. I would really be happy to de-randomize this algorithm, but the problem is that this algorithm is based on having a very few randomized steps, roughly log star n rounds, after which the graph is shattered. 
shattered into very small pieces that can be solved fast. Currently, we don't have any, almost any interesting effect, shattering effect that one can show when using bound and independence. Even if we have them, this shattering effect, you still have the issue of conditional expectation to solve. But the starting point is just how to show shattering effect with bound and independence. When we move on to the second gap that we have for MIS and maximal matching, here we have a very nice square root log delta round algorithm, for example, by Gavari and Yuto. And this algorithm is based on round compression. But all these algorithms of round compression, they are based on the following thing. Let's parsify the graph in a way that if we let the standard algorithm work only on the sparsified graph, at least for our rounds, the algorithm is going to make some progress, okay? This kind of algorithms are, again, very hard to de-randomize because the conditional expectation is not local. It, ba it is based on some information in the R ball, but the graph is too dense. I cannot see my R ball. If I could see my R ball, I could just work on it and solve it. So having this handling with this non-local uh, conditional expectation, it's another uh, a strong barrier. Okay, so to sum up, currently for at least most algorithms, classical algorithms, we do have deterministic bounds that match the local randomized bounds. But in the future, we would really want to narrow the gap between the randomized MPC complexity and the deterministic MPC complexity. For the sublinear MPC, the holy grail should be something like log of the local complexity. This at least should be indicated by a Gavari, Kuhn, and Yuto. But for the linear MPC, this is a totally different story. Here, skies are the limit. We have no lower bounds whatsoever. Presumably, maybe constant round, can, in constant round, we can solve anything. Okay. And I just mentioned here, like, few concrete open problems. I mentioned maybe very, just two. Um, beside mm -hmm. the... I'm gonna have your two minutes over time. <laughs> ah, okay, 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 okay. So you can look at it at 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 the website later. On. Okay. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, it's just in for those of you in the that don't have a way of unmuting yourself. Um, type in the chat and I'll unmute you, or type in the chat and I'll read the question, whichever you prefer. And maybe while we're waiting for questions, go back a slide so they can look at your open questions. Yeah. Okay. So at least they can read it. Uh, and uh, do we have anybody that? Uh, okay. Uh, Somebody is asking, what is the CDP reference? Yeah. So this is uh, to my uh, Davies and myself. Ah, oh, cool. Okay. And. A, okay, a, okay, I'm getting a couple questions here. So maybe I'll let a, um, I, we don't have too much time, but I'll, a, I'll unmute Yannick a, and Yannick can ask you the question. Yes, hi, nice talk. Uh, I'm just wondering, are you aware of a paper in the distributed context that uses PRGs for de-randomization? Yeah, somehow? yeah. So yeah, yeah. So we have we have a few. Uh, I have a work with uh, Elon Yogev that compute a eating set using a PRG that fools uh, a DNA formulas. Actually, after that, we learned that that was an overkill. Maybe you can do it even faster. Uh, we have a paper with Michal Dori that solves some variant of eating set using PRG. Uh, I also have other works not in the local setting that use PRG in the distributed setting. So yeah especially those by Gopalan, uh, that full DNF and CNF read once formula. This is found to be very useful. Okay, and we have another question by Sohail. Uh, hi, Mirav. Um, hey. So I, ha uh, so, so I have a question. Uh, do you think it's possible to get faster randomized MPC algorithms by designing faster deterministic MPC algorithms, just like we have in the local model? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and actually it has to 
it relates to this complexity theoretical question that I posed. I mean, in the, in the local model, we have this shattering effect, which we know that is necessary. Uh, I think that the sublinear uh, setting kind of resembles more the local model, um, at least by, uh, uh, by the work of, uh, uh, of Mohsen and Fabian and, uh, and Yara. So for that, I would guess that yes. For the linear uh, MPC, that is that I'm not sure. For that, I feel like we should really understand what the network decomposition analog or what's the general derandomization structure that we should have. But I'm not sure that it should follow the local framework, at least. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to take all the rest of the questions offline um, a, and start with the um, short talks. Uh, so our first speaker is Sebastian Brandt on lower bounds for ruling sets in the local model. Um, 